Um, Sherry, am I right that you were originally brought into Tiny Toons to mainly write for the Bad Bunny character? Yeah. Since that is the case, and you also invented Slappy Squirrel, uh, what I really like about your writing is... Uh, we have another reviewer called the Nostalgia Chick, and she has a term called the Smurfette Principle. And this is about how a children's show wants to be gender neutral by throwing in a token chick, pretty much. And it's almost a cliche to say men can't write for women, but most of these female leads were written as females first before they were written as actual characters. And I can say growing up with uh, Bab, Slappy, Dot, uh, I always saw them as characters first before I saw them as females. And I guess what I'm wondering is, was there ever a conscious effort to fight how females were being written in anime shows at that time, or was this just how you saw the characters? I was never really um, into girly girl characters when um, I was young. I remember liking Groucho Marx and Harpo Marx. I, I liked Bugs Bunny the best out of the Warner Brothers. I liked uh, Gomez on the Addams Family. I always liked the funny one, you know? And so uh, I was never into princesses or any of that kind of thing. So it didn't really factor in um, for me to write from that perspective for Babs or any of the girl characters that I wrote for because it wasn't um, how I looked at the world. And no one ever said, oh, you know, let's bring in girl issues for Babs or for Dot or for anyone. And I don't think I would have, um, first of all, known. In fact, I know I wouldn't have known how to do that very well because I don't look at the world that way. I didn't try to make Babs one of the fellas or I didn't try to make Dot one of the fellas. Certainly not Dot because, um, I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had with her playing up or her girlish charms that she knows. Or at least she thinks she knows what she's got. No, I, 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 I wasn't conscious. It was just uh, the way I sort of approach things. Well, let's talk about the animation. The animation was always great, but it did seem to have a lot of variation. The style would change very often. Sometimes it would be very solid, other times it would be very bouncy, sometimes it was subtle, sometimes it was exaggerated. Uh, how did that work? Was there different animation groups? Did it depend on the director? Like five different different companies um, that, that would, you know, be farmed out a certain short. We were employing most of Asia at the time. Uh, we had studios set up all over uh, Korea and Japan, uh, New Zealand at one point. There was a company called TMS. There was a company called Wang. Like Acom, I think, in uh, Japan was one of the top studios. Whatever you sent there always came back looking great. I could see that like Wang had a style of drawing the Warners that was a little bit more roundy. Acom was a little bit more, you know, a angular and stuff. So yeah, each company had its own way of doing it. And then other studios, it would depend on uh, you know, what they, were, uh, what they were up against. You wouldn't always get their best crew. You know, we'd get it back and, and it would literally look like, you know, Yakko's eyes were melting off his face. And you'd be like, oh, we're in trouble. Certain ones came back so hashed, you know, you couldn't save them in editing. You had to try and make them into something else. There would be a de detailed storyboard about exactly what would happen. Then the timing person would come in and say, okay, the gag from Yakko to go from this position to this position is so many frames. These days, there isn't as much control. You sort of just, you know, show me a storyboard and you ship it over and you kiss it goodbye and, and hope nobody looks really gross. Now let's talk about one of the biggest factors on the show, the music. Particularly the songs. We all know Richard Stone did incredible scores and incredible music. But with every episode, there had to be a minimum of like two to five songs in an episode. Uh, many of them using public domain music or satirizing famous musicals. How did writing songs for the show work? Did the writers come up with it? Did the musicians come up with it? Was it sort of both? We had you know, done a lot of music in improv, and so we were used to throwing it into, uh, you know, into sketches. I think for me, what, what really got me interested in including more music was that uh, it paid residuals. When we all found out we would get extra money for writing songs, we wrote a lot of songs. No. For a while, I, everything I wrote was a light opera. We had so, so many great music composers, uh, people scoring the show. Richard Stone and, and the Bernsteins. Sometimes uh, we would throw them some lyrics that they would also have to like uh, turn into little jingles and everything. You would write the lyrics first. And then it was up to Richard Stone to um, find a way to make it sound like the original, but not so much that we'd get sued. What can I say? I love the lyrics. And the musicians were great. They knew exactly how to craft the songs 
you know, to stay within the legal limits at the time. Anybody could do it. Everybody did it. Everybody. I can't think of anybody that didn't write at least some songs. Our legal guy, uh, we had one legal guy who'd stop by uh, once every two years. He goes, yeah, yeah, you guys are doing fine. You know, you're, you're staying off the, you know, you're not getting us any uh, letters from lawyers. So yeah, they were, they were masters, uh, you know, Richard Stone and the, uh, our other composers were masters at keeping it, you know, just one side of uh, a phone call. If I were a rich man, yabba dibba 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 If I were the gut pigeon, cooey 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 fettuccine cream sauce parmesan. Then we had a guy like Randy Rogel who, who comes in and he was working on Batman and he said, hey Tom, he walked up one day and said, you know, I got this little song, I, I wrote it a year ago and it, it wasn't particularly written for Animaniacs, but I said, I think it would be cool for your show. And so he played it, and everybody that heard it said, yeah, we should we should have Yakko. We have Rob Paulson sing this and put it in the show. It really didn't have anything to do with any other part of the show, but it was uh, it turned into Yakko's world. United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic, Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too. Talk about uh, hits on the Internet. I mean, people remember the show for, for this song. Bolivia, then Argentina, and Ecuador, Chile, Brazil, Costa Rica. So once we had Rogel aboard, uh, we said, hey, yeah, Randy, you, you can stay. <laughs> And then Rob Paulson, who was so amazing, is so, so amazing, that he could deliver on a song like that, right? I mean, I've seen him do it live. I can't even believe it. He's amazing. Costa Rica, Belize, Nicaragua, Bermuda, Bahamas, Tobago, San Juan, Paraguay, Uruguay, Suriname, and French Guiana, Barbados, and Guam. I actually tried memorizing that song when I was a kid. Um, I, I don't recall doing very well. I think I got up to Canada. But, yeah, it, it's a obviously a very well-written song. My son took the um, AP history test, and he said kids in the class were singing the president's song before the test. So I thought that was pretty funny. John Tyler, he liked country folk. And after him came President Polk. Zachary Taylor liked to smoke. His breath killed friends whenever he spoke. And then it became once he, we saw how, or Tom saw how successful he was at the first one. Then it just became, well, let's let Randy, you know, name all the planets. Let's him, you know, name all the molecules and I don't know what I'm saying, but you know what I mean? So then we were literally, we, we would literally throw Randy uh, a song idea. Like, how about like, you know... You ever been stoned, Randy? I don't think Randy has ever been stoned, but, you know, when you contemplate the universe, Randy, you know, like, like the whole universe could be on the head of a pen, you know? And uh, so then he, he wrote Yakko's Universe, which I, I think is uh, uh, just a beautiful song. Cause there's a hundred billion galaxies that stretch across the sky filled with constellations, planets, moons, and stars. And still the universe extends to a place that never ends, which is maybe just inside a little jar. He really took it to the next level um, about, you know, what a song for Animaniacs is, is going to be. And then Deanna, I think she did a whole Good Feathers parody um, that was all singing and stuff. Um, that was not my, I couldn't even, oh, that just made my head hurt. With Les Miserables, Animal, that was um, Deanna Oliver who did that. And uh, she was very familiar with the musical, obviously. Master of the house, dowling out the charm, ready with an handshake and an open Bitten in the butt, gotten on for terror, took a little nibble from the barrier. Now, how on earth did you guys get Bernadette Peters? Because that wasn't just a walk-on cameo, that was one of the main characters. She was in the opening credits, and she's pretty much a goddess of Broadway. I mean, she was huge. I think, I, I honestly, I mean, I think Steven Spielberg's name carries a lot of clout. Andrea Romano and Tom Ruger sort of had talked about it and said, you know, she would be great. Um, boy, if only we could get her. And then everyone's like, ah, Steven. I know that Andrea Romano was um, putting it out there to a lot of singers first. And um, somehow she got through to Bernadette Peters' people and uh, she said yes, which was amazing. At the end of the road is a city of light, the city of romance. We'll be drinking merry and dance. And with every love can all of our children tonight. We were very lucky to, to get her. We would have to like sort of work around her schedule. She would come out once every uh, month and maybe we'd do two or three of her cartoons then. And so she would have to sing, learn and sing. There were at least two songs per, per cartoon. Some of them were like ballads and big, big whopping songs. There is a flat in Gay Perry, safe on a tree lined avenue. She's a performer. She didn't want to do these things like that. 
I mean, she needed to, like, hone them. And then what a treat to actually go into a recording session and actually get to hear her sing in person, because it's just astonishing. Out here in the shadows and out here is a promised land out here. And, you know, some of the performances are almost like, oh, they're almost touching, haunting, you know. This place, our home. 